Good morning, Windsor. It's really good to be together. And uh, we've got a few announcements. The, uh, this is something that uh, it's been on my mind since, I mean, we've done it a few times, but we had this prayer day down at, in Westchester at the, uh, the abortion um, facility there. And really a uh, powerful thing to do, uh, to go there and to pray. And, you know, you get different kinds of people that are right on the front steps of that place and on the street around there. So we were there praying, and, and um, there's a group that are doing this for 40 days to try to pray for an end for abortion and uh, to just that God would make it clear uh, what is true and what is right and the value of life and that he would use us as witnesses for that. So thank you to everyone that did that, and thank you to everyone that prayed and that continues to pray for that. Uh, there is an America for Christ offering this month. So our missions board is um, working on this. The month of March is a time uh, for the America for Christ offering. Each year, the missions board chooses different missions or missionaries supported by Windsor that work in various ways to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in local or state side settings. The recipients this year are uh, Harvest USA, a ministry that seeks to help people affected by sexual sin and equips local churches to do the same. Reverend Rick Bunker, the Philadelphia Racetrack Chaplaincy, laboring in love to families and workers who live on the back stretch of Philadelphia Racetrack and to the Charles Simeon Trust, which trains men and women to be biblical expositors of God's word. That's the America for Christ offering. There will be a business meeting on March 17th. We'll begin with a time of prayer and then get into the business. Uh, one item is that uh, Mr. Jim Depp has been nominated as treasurer uh, for the church. A couple of, uh, one, one other thing, the vote for deacons for the two men that have been nominated and that were examined uh, over many past months and then this past month at the uh, business meeting, this past week, I should say, are uh, Aaron Stern and Rick Bassler. There are ballots in the back in the lobby, and what you want to do is take a, an envelope and to take one piece of paper, and on that, to vote, if you are a member of Windsor Baptist Church and uh, you're at least 18 years old, you write uh, the first name of each of those deacon candidates, either write Rick, he spells it R-I-C, or he won't be offended, I'm sure, if it's spelled otherwise. And Aaron, A-A-R-O-N. And then below that, on this piece of paper, write the name and then write yes or no. Okay, so if you're voting for them to become deacons, you write yes. And then um, you can submit those. Oh, and then you put it in the envelope. And then you write your name on the outside of the envelope. And then you can give it to Rhonda Marks. Can give it to Rhonda Marks. And I believe... Uh, I'm told that it can be turned in today or by Wednesday, the 10th. That's this Wednesday. Okay, and she's here in the office Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Very good. Lots of announcements, so let's transition now. We have a video of some of our new members, and we'd like to show this um, right before we do our first scripture reading. Kaylani Barrar, and this is my favorite verse. It's uh, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. And I guess what I really love about Windsor is that the community and how everyone's very, um, they hold one another accountable and it's very, uh, very Christ-centered. Hi, my name's Shane Barrar. Uh, my favorite verse would be in John 3, verse 12, and it is, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Uh, my favorite thing about Windsor is also the, the fellowship, the people, everybody's so nice, welcoming. So, 
Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alvin Wells. My favorite verse is uh, Revelations 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door to me, I will come in with him and sup with him and he with me. And uh, one of the favorite things I like about Windsor is their commitment to the youth of the church. That's the future of the church. And also their openness to everyone who comes and enters. Hello, I'm Zach Chandler. And one of my favorite scripture verses is Ephesians 1, 7, which says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. And one of my favorite things about Windsor is the church's reverence for God's word. Hello, my name is Helene May. Uh, I became a Christian 50 years ago, um, uh, watching Billy Graham on TV. And it, he really spoke to my heart. And um, my favorite verse is, delight thyself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that's from Psalms. Um, why I came here, um, I was attracted to the friendliness of the people here and also biblical truth. I felt that the Bible was really taught here, and I enjoyed the music. Hi, I'm Jacob McClure. And I'm Sarah McClure. And one of our favorite scripture verses has been especially meaningful for us this year is Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And one thing that we really liked about Windsor was as soon as we walked in the door, it uh, was a very welcoming atmosphere. It felt like family and it felt like we were home. And, and one other that we don't want to miss, Alexandra. Uh, <laughs> uh, godly, uh, wonderful testimony that we got to hear last week, uh, but we were not able to record her. She was tied up this week with some other things. So welcome to all of you and we will recognize you a little bit later right before the Lord's Supper. Our call to worship is from Psalm 118. This passage is incredibly important in the New Testament. Psalm 118 is so much about who Jesus is and what he did, especially that last week of his earthly ministry before the cross and his victory over the grave. So hear God's word from Psalm 118, and I'm going to read the entire psalm. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. 
Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, we thank you and praise you for all that Jesus has done to win this incredible victory over death and the grave so that we can have life with you. Guide us now and, and help us to focus our minds and our hearts as we call on you in song in worship. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Come, let us adore him. What do these words mean? This week as I was reading a work of Christian fiction, the author wrote these words. Adoration is all about a mindset, a lifestyle of worship. When I hear the words of our first song, I'm reminded of Job. He worshiped and followed God, but when it was all taken away, though he continued to bless the Lord, he began to question him and ask, in a sense, why me? God's response was to ask where Job was when the world was formed, and if he was the one who held all things together. And then in Job 42, it says, then, the, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. When we truly see God for who he is, we recognize that we are of no consequence in comparison to God the Almighty, seated on his throne. We can do nothing but come before him in adoration. Please stand and join me as we sing, Behold Our God. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Hold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us Let us adore. 
by this book if you ever get a chance to pick it up somewhere uh, the heart of Christ for sinners and sufferers right now you're surrounded by sinners and sufferers uh, if, if you don't see one you can look at me uh, I am a, a great sinner and many of us are suffering in many different ways and it, what this book speaks to is Christ's heart for us in the midst of our sin in the midst of our suffering he is still for us he's not against us and he took us to Isaiah, or the author took us to Isaiah, and I, I think frequently misunderstood idea. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as heaven is above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, so my thoughts are your thoughts. When I'm sinned against, my ways are to want revenge. My ways are to want to get even. God's way is to love us care for us, to be with us, despite our sin, in the midst of our suffering. Thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to receive the spirit of the lowly, and to receive the heart of the contrite. Thank you, Lord. How deep is the Father's love for us?
invite you to be seated. Good morning. It is great to look out over the congregation this morning and see how many people that have come out this morning to worship with us today. And on top of that, we also still have uh, our, our audience that are watching this uh, through live feed. But I would say that uh, if you had the experience that I've had already this morning, it is great to hear so many voices singing in such a wonderful way with praise in our hearts to the Lord. That's a biblical thing, isn't it? The Bible tells us that. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. We thank the Lord for this opportunity to worship here today. This is our time of corporate prayer. So if you would now join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is a great day for us to be in your house this morning to sing praises to your name and to give you thanks for the many wonderful ways that you have been blessing us here at Windsor Baptist Church. As the psalmist said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth for all generations. Lord, we thank you that we can come today to worship you freely, and we are grateful that we have the opportunity to hear from your word this morning. And this is especially a wonderful day for us here at Windsor Baptist Church as we have already seen the testimonies of some of the new members that are joining with us and uniting with this local church. We thank you especially for them, for Alexandra Welsh and Alvin Wells and Helene May and Zach Chandler, and Kaylani and Shane Barrar, and Jacob and Sarah McClure, who come to unite with Windsor Baptist Church. And we pray, Lord, that we would be a blessing to them, just as they are a blessing to us. And we thank you also for the children that come with them. And we pray, Lord, that we have the opportunity to help them as parents, uh, to teach their children here, your truth and your ways, that they may grow and learn through biblical truth and be a light in a lost and dying world. Father, we thank you again, as Pastor mentioned this morning, for those who participated in this prayer vigil that we had in Westchester, in front of the doors of Planned Parenthood. We pray, Lord, that somehow and in some way that even now, some young women that may be contemplating taking such a drastic step would reconsider and search their hearts and minds for your answer. And Lord, I pray that for those that reject Planned Parenthood and any other abortion centers, we pray, Lord, that you would direct them to a place that they can get real help and that they would honor you with a decision to reject abortion and to pursue life. Father, we pray for our services this morning, and especially as we now come to the place where we are to examine our own hearts and our own minds. And Lord, as we know today, as we participate in the ordinance of the church, this communion table, we know that we are not worthy on our own to receive these elements. We lay our sins before you 
at the table of grace. And we confess them. And we ask that you would wash us clean and make us whiter than snow. And we know and trust that as we have confessed our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. And as we do participate today, Lord, in this communion service, as we have entered here uh, to learn from your truth, may we go forth and proclaim that salvation comes through knowing Christ. And we are grateful and thankful, thankful for his atoning death on the cross at Calvary that has given us the opportunity to have eternal life. Please use us in whatever ways that you will to glorify and magnify your blessed holy name. And for all these things, we give you thanks and praise in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we can do all things. The scripture reading is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. I invite you to stand for the reading of his word. In Mark chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus is speaking to the chief priests and the scribes and the elders who have just challenged his authority. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get them to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This is God's word. Please be seated. Did you know... God accomplishes his good purposes for his people even through the wicked deeds of wicked people. We will see that in this passage, in this parable today, and we will look at this under three headings. First, the selfish stewards, then sovereign purpose, and finally, steadfast love. First, about the selfish stewards. The first thing you have to understand about this parable is that it is an indictment of failed stewardship. What is stewardship? Stewardship is when a person is entrusted with a responsibility by another authority that is over them. In this parable, we see an indictment of failed stewardship, which is about the religious leaders in Israel at that time. Now, one of the rules for understanding any parable in the Bible is to look at what is happening around it. Look at the context, the things that are happening right before especially, help us to understand what the parable means. In this passage, this parable is set when Jesus is in Jerusalem, and this is the last week of his life. 
What happened before this is Jesus had entered Jerusalem on a donkey, and they were praising him, and we call that the triumphal entry. He rides in like a king, and the people in the city, a crowd gathered, and they were praising him with the words of Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. That's Psalm 118. And that psalm actually has so much to do with the things that are happening this week. Another thing that happened is Jesus went to the temple area and he flipped over the tables where they would change money and where they would sell doves. And he would stop people. And that's what he did. He stopped people from trading, buying, and selling. And when he did that, these religious leaders were especially offended. They were upset for a few reasons. The first reason is they believed we're the ones that are in charge here. We're the ones that have authority over this temple. Okay? And in a way, they were right. So they were offended that someone would come in and act like they are in charge rather than these religious leaders. So they asked Jesus this question in the passage right before this parable. They said, hey, Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority? Now, children, I want you to understand this. Look at how Jesus responds to this question. In fact, the passage next week will be another good example. When people ask you questions, they're not always looking for an honest answer. Some questions, therefore, should not be answered. And this is how Jesus handled himself in that passage. He said, he said, I'll answer you, but you answer one question for me first. And then he asks, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from man? And what happened is they couldn't answer. They couldn't answer Jesus. They were tied up in knots. And the reason is they feared people. They wouldn't answer because of the crowds. They were completely tied up in knots. And it was right then, it was right when they couldn't answer him and they were tied up in these knots that Jesus told this parable. They, these religious leaders, are challenging Jesus. There's a crowd around and Jesus says, let me tell you a parable. So he does, and he begins in verse 1, and immediately as he begins this parable about this vineyard and the owner who, who digs it and who tends to it and provides everything that is needed for it, it's almost identical word for word what is in Isaiah chapter 5. And so everyone there would know, oh yeah, we've heard this one before. This is from Isaiah chapter 5, but when Jesus is telling this parable, there's a twist, and that would have stood out brightly to them. The twist is this. In this parable, there are tenant farmers. There are people that are stewards put in place to work and tend to this vineyard to take care of it. And the owner goes away. Now in Isaiah 5, you understand that the vineyard is God's people. And what he wants from his people is good fruit. And what that means is that his people become what he wants us to be. So Israel was supposed to be fruitful in their righteousness, in the way that they lived, in the way that they honored him among all people. When he says there were these farmers that were supposed to care for this vineyard, that's what is different. And those farmers were the stewards. And, and everyone there, in fact, at the end of this passage, you see that the religious leaders knew that Jesus was talking about them when he told this parable. Those were the men who were in charge of God's people. Those are the farmers in this parable. Now, one thing that we should see is in this parable is the goodness of the owner, how generous he is, how he provides everything that is needed, and, by contrast, how wrong are these farmers that are set to care for the vineyard. He provides everything, and he is so patient as this parable goes on. That is the picture we're given of God. Now, the next thing that you need to see in this parable is the progression that happens with the farmers. And this is where we see the problem. These religious leaders were selfish stewards. They were greedy for themselves. And it didn't just happen immediately in one thing. There's a progression with them. This 
self-serving rebellion against God, this self-serving rebellion against the owner of the land, of the vineyard, in the farmers. At first you see that when servants come, they beat him. The first one is beaten and sent away. Now what is happening? The, the owner says, I want some of the fruit from the vineyard. I want part of it. Now they have all that they need. They have a life, they have work to do, they have all the provision because of the owner of the land. And they won't give him the part that he requests back. And it begins with this. They beat the first one and send him away. And what happens is it ramps up. It increases with each one that is sent. Another he sends. It says that they beat his head and treated him shamefully. This has a tone of mocking. This means they're beating him and they're shaming him saying, you don't belong here, get out of here. So they're growing bold in their rebellion. And then another comes. Another comes from the owner. Jesus says, and this one they killed. They actually killed one. Now, this is a picture and the progression of what was happening with God and his people Israel as he was sending prophets to them. And the history of the prophets is that they would suffer by declaring God's message. God would speak to his prophets and he would speak through his prophets and the people did not want to hear it. So the prophets suffered. They suffered in different ways. Some were ignored and rejected. Sometimes people would listen, but they were the minority. Generally, the prophets would suffer and some would die. And so that's what he says. He sent many. Some they beat, others they killed. And as you listen to this, and as they were standing there listening to these things, you think, this is outrageous. This is so incredibly wrong. And you have to remember the context, what was happening there. The religious leaders are hearing this. Jesus is staring them down, as it were, face to face, telling this parable about them. And so are the crowds. And then he says, lastly, he sent his one beloved son, thinking, they will respect my son. Now, as you hear that, you can imagine the crowds thinking, you know, you get into a story sometimes, and Jesus is telling this, and they're thinking, no, no, don't send your son. Don't, it's like when you watch a horror movie, don't go into that house. They're listening to this parable, and they're thinking, don't send the son. Now, this parable is about stewards set over God's people and how they rebelled against him. And we are listening to this and we're thinking, yeah, those religious leaders back in Jesus' time, they were terrible. But I want to tell you that this is also about everyone who selfishly ignores God. Anyone in this world who is only focused on themselves and is not thinking about God or living for him as a steward is also a part of the problem because every one of us is a steward here's the question that I want to ask you do you ignore God in verse 7 Jesus pulls back the curtain on the rebellious hearts that he is revealing and he says this that those farmers said to themselves and he's talking about the dialogue the motivation of those that are in rebellion against God, they say this, this is the heir when the one beloved son comes. This is the heir, the one that owns all of this. And they say, come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Now, do you know why Jesus was killed on a Roman cross? The human motivation was to have God's good things without God. From the human perspective, every human heart begins with this determination for self, for selfish gains. And it's what ruins us. When Jesus finishes this parable, it says they knew full well that he was talking about them and just look at their hardened resolve. Look at how they responded to the parable. They do not repent. They do not change. 
he is revealing their very hearts. He knows that they want to kill him. And I look at this and I say, what an amazing savior. Look at what Jesus did. He knew exactly what they were thinking. He knew what they were planning. He knew that they wanted to kill him and then they would kill him. And he gives them this opportunity. But there's no repentance. And they ended up doing exactly what the farmers did. Killed the son. Now in my mind's eye, I see Jesus looking at this group of religious leaders when he asks the next question. He says, what will the owner of the vineyard do? What will the owner of the vineyard do to people that ignore God? What will God do to people that have been entrusted with things, that have ignored him? Everybody knows the answer to that, in theory. Everybody knows God will do what is right. God will do what is just. That's what God does. And so Jesus says in verse 9, he will come. God is holy. This is what he says. He will come and he will destroy the tenant farmers and will give the vineyard to others. He will entrust the care of his people to others. Do you know that there are no more scribes today? There are no more Pharisees or chief priests. You won't meet the people that had those titles back then. And the reason is that the Lord Jesus, in his sovereignty, decided that the temple would be destroyed, it would be wiped out, and the care of his people would be entrusted to others. And that's the way it is today. He would give the care of his vineyard to others. Now here's a question. How did they get to that point? How did those rebellious, selfish stewards get to this point? Here's the thing. It started small and it always does. They were self-serving in little ways and then it grew. They didn't recognize God's authority over them. They forgot that they were stewards and they grabbed for ownership. I can say this to everyone here. You are a steward. God created you. God gave you everything that you are and everything that you have. Your intellect, your possessions, your health, your relationships. Everything that you have has been entrusted to you by the one who is sovereign over all. You are a steward. You will give an account to God for what he has entrusted to you. But God is good. God is generous. God is patient and merciful. Church, God placed you where you are and he gave you what ministry you have. God has entrusted you with the care of one another as we are gathered together as a church. God says this, that he entrusts us with a little bit. And then if we're faithful with a little bit, he entrusts us with more. So if you have any ministry at all, it's because God has allowed you to have that ministry. To pray, to serve, to teach to show mercy, to govern something. And I want to say this to everyone who is here. This is a question. Are you aware that you are a steward under God? Friends, make sure that you are a faithful steward of what God has entrusted to you. I'll tell you this. It can't be done by your strength. And we will get to that. But he gives what is necessary. Let's look at that. First of all, beware of the voice of the tenant farmers as it might well up in you. Guard yourself. Guard your heart against that mindset that the tenant farmers had. Whenever someone says, uh, I'll talk about myself, I'll talk about ministry leaders, okay? Whenever someone says, that's my church, it bothers me as if we are possessors of something, as if we are owners. 
I, I, I tell my wife, I tell my children this, it bothers me when I go to a retail setting because I worked in a retail setting and people talk about the things that are being sold in a place like, I worked at Sears. You're not gonna see many Sears anymore. They're all closing down. And people would say, I have two snowblowers in the back or I have this, I have that. And I, I was like, no, you don't, you don't own them. <laughs> and, and when someone says, that's my church, if that, if that tone means I belong there, that's fine. If, if it means I, I'm a part of the family that is that church, that's fine. But if someone means it in a possessive way, like this is my church and it will happen the way I want it to happen, that is wrong. You know why? Because like this pulpit, this church, as much as any of us have authority in this church, it's because God has made us stewards. It belongs, we belong, the people, the possessions, all of this belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have been invested and entrusted with it for a short time. But we are quickly fading, and we will be replaced until the Lord Jesus comes. You know, everything that you have in your life is entrusted to you, your money, your time, your houses. And Jesus has lent these to you to cultivate good fruit. I have a friend named Sergio. We did undergrad together at Penn State. And we both had to work really hard to get through college. We had to work different jobs. He did two engineering degrees. I did one. Impressive guy, good friend of mine. He lives out in Colorado now. And after we got out, you know, you start making some money. At least he did. He went into engineering. <laughs> and um, so he was living in Northern Virginia. That's where he grew up. And he likes photography and he likes hiking. So he bought this really nice camera, very expensive. One of the first things he bought with his new salary and his car was parked on the street in a town in Northern Virginia, and someone broke into his car and stole this really expensive camera. And I knew how hard he had worked to get to that point in his life. And we got together and I said, man, and I, I mean, he could see I was red. I said, I said, oh man, can you figure out who did it? Like, let's get him. That was in my mind. And he said, he, he was cool. He was completely at peace and he said, it belongs to God. He said, Ben, it belongs to God. So if God wants it to be stolen and go somewhere else, I guess that's God's will, and I'm okay with it. And I looked, I thought, that is a great mindset to have. Everything he has belongs to God. Even this first prize of a, you know, a good thing that he purchased. But look, there's a horrible creep toward taking for yourself what belongs only to God. And that is something that we will find if we examine our hearts. We need to reset those. Now, to understand how God corrected this, let's look secondly at God's sovereign purpose. And these last two we'll cover more quickly. In verses 10 and 11, we're going to look at these last two points. God's sovereign purpose and God's steadfast love. First, his sovereign purpose. This, these verses are a quote from Psalm 118. There's so much to say about it. This passage of the Bible is just filled with what God promised he would do in Psalm 118 in his Messiah. This outrageous injustice that Jesus said, this is what is happening here. Let's just call it for what it is. You guys are rebellious. You're, you're selfish stewards and you will kill the only beloved son. This was exactly God's plan. These things that were happening, God was sovereign over them all. Do you know what the word sovereignty means? It means that God is in charge of everything. And he causes things to happen. He actually orchestrates what happens. Does that mean that people don't sin? No. It, does it mean that um, God makes anyone sin? No. God wields it. God controls it in such a way that he is above and over everything that happens. He is sovereign. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. And their sin, as they were being rebellious against God, their sin could be used and wielded for God's purposes. God, it is said, God is the only one who can wield sin without sinning. And he does it because he is different than us. He alone is holy. And so Jesus says that he is the stone that the builders rejected. And so there's this analogy that you get these guys that are, that are construction workers and they're building things and they get this big stone and they look at it and they say, this thing is so 
different. It's so, so many weird angles and the size. We can't do anything with this. Get rid of it. But then the chief architect comes along and says, this is perfect. This will be the chief cornerstone. And all the pieces will fit together around it. And Jesus, it is said in the scriptures, was that one. He was like that stone that was rejected. But by God, by God's sovereign purpose, was at the very center and is at the very center of all of God's people. So they killed him. That's how the builders rejected him. But there was more happening than they knew. God was orchestrating all of it. He is sovereign and he rules all things. He has become the cornerstone. This happened when he suffered and then was glorified. He went into the grave, he died on the cross, and he was buried. But Jesus was vindicated. Jesus came alive again. He walked out of the tomb. He appeared to many. He overcame death. He overcame sin. And now he is the center of all of God's people. And all of us who belong to him are connected to him in God's family, in God's house. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was vindicated, and we who trust in him will be similarly vindicated. So here's something for you to remember. Evil men doing their worst can only serve God's good redemptive purposes. Like, like Joseph said to his brothers after they sold him into slavery, after they were they, they put him into a pit. They were going to just get rid of him. And then they were like, no, let's make some money. Let's sell him as a slave. And then he ends up in Egypt, and they meet him, and he's the second in command in all of Egypt, ruling the whole thing. And he could say to them, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good, and for the saving of many lives. So it was with Jesus. So it was with, so it is with every one of his people. Evil people will do evil things against God's people, but God will use it for good. No one could do anything to you or to this culture or in this world unless God allows it and permits it, and it will be for the good of his people and for the glory of his name. Now, the first half of verse 11 says this, this was the Lord's doing. I want you to notice one word there at first. The word was. This was a psalm that David wrote that spoke. And this is a poetic verse from Psalm 118. And it looks back on what the Lord did. Okay? Jesus can speak this when he's telling this parable. And say, this was the Lord's doing. It views the establishing of Christ as the cornerstone from the perspective of it has already happened. It's saying, this was the Lord's doing. That's why in that psalm it says... This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, we say that, and we don't just say that because the sun comes up or because we're happy anyway, even though it's snowing or raining. We say that as believers because it's the day of salvation in Christ. And every time we say that verse, it's because of what Jesus accomplished. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus spoke these words on the other side of the cross before it happened. Before he was rejected and before he rose again, he spoke prophetically about what would happen as if it already did happen. Jesus spoke these words, and he spoke them from our perspective today. And this is the voice of everyone who believes in him. This is the voice of everyone who recognizes what the Lord did. We can look back and say, this was the Lord's doing. Okay, so it's is from our perspective, having been accomplished. These are the words of all who recognize the goodness of what Jesus did. And we say, the wisdom of God. The God, only God could have orchestrated this, thought this up. And then we look at the second half of that verse in verse 11. We see the steadfast love of God. Steadfast love. And it says this, this was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. This is an amazing thing. We say, this is marvelous. We marvel at it. We look and we say, I am just gripped by what has happened here. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Looking back on what at the time seemed so wrong, 
Now we see it through the wisdom of God. And joy wells up in, in the believer and says, marvelous, marvelous what God does. Marvelous what he did. We're going to see more as the days unfold. We're going to see more as God reveals everything. When Christ returns, we will say forever, marvelous, what a God. This is the cry of every heart that grasps the gospel. Every heart that looks on what Christ has done, looks back on it and says, that is an amazing thing. Jesus was rejected. He, he redeemed us and, and won a victory through death and suffering. And we look at it and we say, that is amazing. I had to be forgiven of my sins and he took my place. Wow. Who could have thought of such a thing? He predicted it. He said he would do it. He accomplished it. He sends out messengers to let people know. And he opens our eyes to comprehend it. The good news of God. Sinners, broken people can be made whole in him. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And what is so marvelous? What is at the heart of all of this? Friends, it is the love of God for you. What is so marvelous? It is that God would love people that are broken and rebellious, just like those stewards. And when we look at our own hearts, we see that we have the same selfishness. We want to think about ourselves, about what we can have, what we can protect, what we can preserve and, and just get for ourselves. And we tend to ignore God. But God heals us from that. How? His steadfast love. In, in Psalm 118, the first four verses, you see that phrase four times in four verses. His steadfast love endures forever. That phrase, steadfast love, is an Old Testament term that is often used to describe the love of God for his people, which will not ever end. Let me say that again. It is the love of God. It is God saying to his people, I love you. I will do good to you. You will belong to me. I love you. And God says, and I promise I will never stop loving you because my promise to you is steadfast. It is God's steadfast love. I love you. I know you're going to sin. I'm going to forgive you. We are together forever. I have set my love on you. I will never stop loving you. That's what the steadfast love of God is. That is the gospel. That is the good news of, of who Jesus is, what he has accomplished. And who is this for? For whom is this steadfast love? In verse 4, we see it. It is for all who fear the Lord. It is for all who fear the Lord. This shows us who's in and who's out. Who are the people that are, who are grabbed and kept in that steadfast love of God? It is those who fear the Lord. Now, if we look at verse 12, we see a contrast. And this shows us those that are in and those that are out. Look at the contrast that we see here. These steward farmers, these selfish stewards, wanted to grab Jesus right there. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted him out. This is the heir. Come, let's kill him. That's what was in their hearts. But they didn't. Why didn't they? What does verse 12 say? Because they feared the crowd. Now, compare the cowardice of those men with the courage that Jesus had when he faced his own suffering and death, which would be at their hands. Jesus was a picture and a model of those who fear the Lord, who trust him. And these men were those who fear man, who live for the approval of others, who are afraid of what people might do to them. But as the psalm says in 118, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. What does this mean? This is a picture of someone that believes God and trusts him. To take refuge in the Lord, to fear the Lord, to trust in Christ, to believe and trust in him. They all mean the same thing. And here's the basis of our trust. Jesus died on the cross. He gave his life as a ransom for our sin. And then he rose again to life. 
and he's able to save you, all who call on his name will be saved. That is what it means to trust in him. And if you have never trusted in him, or if you need to really reset your life to make sure that you're trusting him and not fearing people or living for selfish gain, do that today. Pray. We will pray again. Say, God, I need to live as a steward. I need to live for your glory. And here is how you respond. You give all of your loyalty and trust to Jesus Christ. You live for him as someone that is connected to him. He's the cornerstone of God's people. And he will change you for being a selfish steward, someone that's an enemy that would kill him and just do away with God, wanting his good things without him, into being an adopted member of his family. Look at, look at what he did. Look at what he did with his parable. What was in their hearts when they said, come, here is the heir. Let's kill him and the, what did they want? The inheritance. They wanted the good things from God without having God. Friends, Jesus gives us and shares with us his entire inheritance as we come to him. The Bible says that we are given all of the good things that we could possibly want and he knows best how to give them and when to give them. The inheritance is for everyone who is joined to the cornerstone, everyone who trusts in Jesus. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, as you come to him, using the same reference to Psalm 118, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. When you trust in him, he forgives you. He welcomes you. He gives you his inheritance. You become an adopted child with Christ in God's family. He welcomes you. And, and here's something else. He makes you something amazing. He makes you something completely new. He makes you what you ought to be. And you know the goodness of it. Now just know this. Not everyone who hears this message will believe it. He says in that same chapter, the honor is for you who believe. The amazing thing that he's making is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Let me tell you, a couple more things as we apply this and finish. Friends, this is one way he changes you. He puts courage in you. The same courage that Jesus displayed when he feared God and stared them down and told this parable. You see it in Acts chapter 4 when Peter and John are dealing with the same religious leaders and they see the boldness of these disciples and they say, they were with Jesus. These are just ordinary, uneducated men. But they were with Jesus, and he puts courage in his servants to be like that. And do you know in that passage, in Acts chapter 4, some of you do because you've been studying this, that Peter references Psalm 118, and he says to these guys, these same religious leaders, he said, Jesus is the stone that you guys who were the builders rejected. That's what's happening here. And they say, don't talk anymore about him. And they beat them, and they put them in prison, and they're like, we're not going to be afraid of you. We're, we're going to keep talking about Jesus. We can do the same thing. And honestly, we live in a world that is changing so fast that is saying, you're not allowed to talk about such things in lots of settings, in work settings, in school settings, and in the public sphere. But God will put courage in you to be faithful to him and to give testament to him and what he has done. Your part is this. Live for God. Do not fear man. Live before the face of God. The Latin phrase for that is quorum Deo. And so in this passage, this is what we have. There are in this world selfish stewards, such were every one of us. But they can only serve God's sovereign purposes as he blesses his people with his steadfast love in Christ. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our sight. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, um, 
what a marvelous thing that you have done and what a marvelous Savior you have sent. We do praise you even now as we call on you in song for Jesus who has become the cornerstone. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Who was, and is, and ever will be. Who was to David, who was to Christ, who was to Creator, who, who was to us the cornerstone. Please stand and join us. Choir members in particular, I hope you join us. Built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. When darkness, oh. when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. stream so join me in prayer our father in heaven uh, we praise you because of the amazing things you have done um, help us to rest in what Christ alone has accomplished the day that you have made we rejoice and are glad in it pray this in his name